Aloha and welcome to this module on continuous integration. Continuous integration is an extremely simple idea and extremely powerful. It's going to revolutionize the way you do development and in particular it's going to make developing in groups way simpler and more efficient than it was before. Once you start using continuous integration, I claim, you'll never want to not do continuous integration when you do development. It's just that good and fun, actually. So let's, let's see what it is. Fortunately, it's not complicated at all given what you've already accomplished in this class. And now you're going to start to see the benefits of the investments that you've made in learning Ant and acquiring our build system that enables you to do automated builds, automated tests, and so forth. This is the payback, continuous integration, super easy for you to do now that you've done all that initial uh, development work. So um, the objectives of this module, we want you to understand why continuous integration is such a rockin' thing and how you can integrate it into your current build development process, which is simple, and how to use uh, a continuous integration tool called, well, unfortunately, it has two names. It's called both Hudson and Jenkins. The reason being that, uh, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, a guy at Sun Microsystems started building a Java-based continuous, continuous integration tool called Hudson. And he did a really good job. Very simple, extremely simple to use, um, very extensible. He had a large user community. By the way, it wasn't only useful for building Java projects. It could build anything at all, really. It just happened to be implemented in Java as its under, underlying language, but that's basically irrelevant for our purposes. It could have been anything. Um, but he happened to do it in Java, and he happened to be at Sun Microsystems, and it was an open source project at Sun Microsystems, all those things being good things. Then Oracle acquired... Sun Microsystems and in the process acquired that project and there were some skirmishes and um, essentially what happens there was a fork in the project so now the Hudson uh, project continues but then the lead developer from Hudson um, and most of the primary committers left to form this new project called Jenkins um, and so kind of out of loyalty I'm using Jenkins but they're almost identical the divergence it was really I think it was kind of like a licensing uh, issue I, I'm not quite sure why exactly what it was that they forked is quite unfortunate really for the community anyway you can pick Hudson you can pick Jenkins they both um, you know I, I don't know whether there's any significant difference in functionality between the two because the code bases are are very similar right now and you'll often when people talk about they'll often talk about Hudson slash Jenkins um, because really either of them are are fine anyway we're gonna use Jenkins in this class so why would we want to use a continuous integration process in general and a technology like Hudson or Jenkins, which implements it in particular. There's other technologies out there, Cruise Control, which is one, um, but but Hudson slash Jenkins is really, I think, the easiest one to use at this point in time. The main idea is that when you have a bunch of people working on a project, you've got the integration problem. Okay, How do you merge together the changes that people have been making to the system in parallel? Okay, in such a way as to make development move along as fast as possible. And there's several ways you can kind of fail to integrate correctly. Um, one way to fail to, or one, one potential cause of failure is when two people modify the same file um, and even maybe the same line. That's certainly going to be a problem when you try to integrate. Another problem could be that people don't even modify the same file, but they modify different files, but they modify these files in such a way that the system no longer compiles. So for example, you know, you're writing some code, you depend upon a class, 
you know, method foo in another class. And then the person um, working on that other class renames or even deletes that method foo, all of a sudden, you know, your, you, your code is broken because they've made a change to the class that you depend upon. A third level is, is uh, test conflicts, and that's when, you know, everything compiles and everything kind of runs, but there's been concurrent changes to the system such that uh, the tests don't pass. So maybe you were, you know, relying on a method which did some kind of computation, returned some value, and then someone unwittingly made a change to that uh, class. Maybe they tried to make it more optimal, work, you know, run, run more quickly, and in so doing changed its semantics so that it didn't return exactly the same value as before. Thus leading to a test failure when you try to run the test on your code, which depends upon their code. Their code now works differently. Your code no longer works through no fault of your own. Okay? So you're going to run into probably all of these different kinds of problems when working together with others. It's a real pain. Okay? So what do we do about that? The problem is that when you have these kinds of errors, figuring out what the problem is and how to correct it can be a problem. And, it, and it's a bigger problem if the time between the moment at which the, the mismatch, you know, the inconsistency in the system occurred and the time when it's actually discovered is long. Okay, so the more time that elapses between the time that you introduce an inconsistency and the time that you detect it means even more things can be done that were based upon that initial inconsistency and uh, you've got to unwind a lot more work. Does that make sense? So ideally, you know, um, ideally we'd like to be able to detect these, these inconsistencies as immediately as possible, as quickly as, as immediately, as quickly as possible because then we haven't done a lot of further work that depended upon those initial problems and so we can rationalize the system, make it consistent, take care of the, the, you know, the compile problems or the testing problems or so forth, close in time to when we actually made the mistake, and then you know, the system can continue on and we don't have many months down the road trying to put pieces together that, that don't actually fit. Okay? So continuous integration arose out of that notion that, whoa, it would be really great if we could take care of those inconsistencies that will inevitably arise when people are working concurrently as fast as possible. And there were some preconditions that had to be satisfied in order for this to work. First thing is, we have to be able to build and test a system automatically, okay, because we want this to be all done automatically. The system must be under configuration management control. And crucially, People need to be committing changes frequently. So the whole thing falls apart if you don't if you work on some you know part of your system, but don't commit it to the to the repository, you know, except every month or so. So you've got to be able to actually divide up your work into small pieces, such that you can finish kind of a logical chunk. The system all works, and you can commit that change to the repository. Okay. Now, if, if all of these things are satisfied, then what you can do is you can have a, another tool that sits out there that's monitoring the, conf the configuration management repository to see when anybody commits anything. And every time somebody commits something, this tool could automatically check out the new version of the system, run your build scripts, run your tests, make sure everything is okay, and if everything's not okay, email the, um, the developers to say there was a problem. Okay, and so what this does is this leads to this idea, continuous integration, as, you know, as the name suggests, which is that people are working concurrently, doing development, but doing development in very tiny increments, increments of only a day or two of work, at which point they check in their changes to the repository, and we have a tool which now automatically makes sure that the resulting, you know, um, committed version of the system is going to pass all its tests and compile and so forth. Okay, so it's really awesome. Um, 
the nice thing about it is that you know you know when the system is not um, is in an inconsistent state, and as long as people are committing regularly, you know it quickly. Um, furthermore, um, because people are committing more frequently, because they get this benefit of continuous integration, that means that the system is more, de you know, it's deployable. It, it moves in, along in smaller increments that are always, you know, kind of usable at that point in time, which leads to a, just a, a nicer kind of development flow. Now what's great about where you guys are is that you now know how to build your system automatically. You now know how to test your system automatically. You now know how to put your systems under configuration management. You hopefully will commit changes frequently. So the only thing left is to have the automated tool that monitors Google project hosting for changes, checks out the stuff and does it. And that's what we're going to show you right now okay here's what the home page for Jenkins looks like um, and you know just it's not a big deal you can see that it runs in a lot of different environments blah 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 blah. okay so um, Jenkins runs as a server I've set one up so you don't have to worry about that there's the URL right there and what you do is you log in to this server now I'm gonna have to give you the password in class. So you guys have to show up to class to get the server so you can actually do this assignment or work with Jenkins. Um, but there's the URL for it. And once you can log into Jenkins, then you can define jobs. And a, and a simple job that we'll show in this screencast is one that connects to Google Project Hosting once a minute to see if you've made any changes during the past minute. If so, check out those changes, build the system, run JUnit PMD checks down find bugs, and then if any problems occur, email the resulting problems to all members of the development team. Fantastic, yeah? Okay. So what about, you know, this whole verify thing? Um, you know, do, do we still need to do it? And the answer is absolutely yes. Okay, you don't want Jenkins to fail. You don't want Jenkins to be detecting all your errors for you. That, because then you're sending out emails to everybody and it's a, a hot mess, as they say on Project Runway. Okay? Instead, you're going to continue to use Verify to make sure, as much as you can, that the system is fine okay, on your local workspace. And then you commit those changes and hopefully 99% of the time, Jenkins builds it and Jenkins is, is basically going to run Verify itself. and everything will be good. What Jenkins is great about detecting, okay, is the following situation, which is all too common. You're working on your system, you add a new class, you document it correctly, you have the test cases, everything's great, okay? Verify runs like a dream on your local environment, but you forgot to SVN add that class file, okay? So that when you commit your changes, you're forgetting to commit that new class file that you've just defined. So on the repository side, it, the system won't even compile anymore, but you don't know it because locally you can run Verify just fine. So there's a whole class of errors like that um, having to do with you know, your, the characteristics of your local workspace. And, and those errors are, are you know, kind of hard to detect because, after all, Verify passes in your local environment. So what's great about Jenkins is that Jen once you do that commit, within one minute, Jenkins is going to actually try to run the build. At that point, compile will fail because you forgot to SVN add it. It's going to send out an email. You'll go, oh my god, I forgot to, you know, I just spaced out, forgot to add it. You can fix it. Jenkins passes. Life is good. Okay, and hopefully that will all occur within this brief interval of time before any other developer is basically even you know, aware or trying to do anything. Without Jenkins, what would happen is verify builds good for you. You commit, you know, the changes, but forgetting to add that new file. You think everything is great. You go to sleep. The next developer, you know, tries to SVN update at like one or two o'clock in the morning because, you know, that's just always how it is. And voila, the system's broken for them. Okay, and they're all bummed out. They do a SVN blame. They find out that you were the last person that committed. They think you didn't pass, you didn't run verify, blah, blah, blah. Then the next morning, 
you wake up, you see this nasty email from them, you write them a nasty email back saying, no, I did run verify, it must be some problem with you, blah, blah, blah. Whole shooting match ensues, you know, blood is shed, you don't speak to each other again, you know, who knows, all this stuff could happen. And it could be all avoided by having Jenkins be able to tell you right away, dude, you forgot to add a file. You know, it's no longer compiling. Once you see that kind of error message, you'll, you're going to immediately realize that's crazy. It compiles for me. And then the next thing you'll realize is, oh, you know, I, I forgot to add that file. So the tranquility of your development team is enhanced by having continuous integration. Okay. The other thing that's great is also Jenkins um, and continuous integration at, at, in general serves as like a sanity check okay so if if it runs let's say that the system runs good in your environment but doesn't run good in somebody else's you know it doesn't pass verify in their environment you're like you know who's who's what's the problem here who's got the problem well if the Jenkins build is successful then you basically know it's some problem with that other person's environment and if the Jenkins build is unsuccessful then you know there's some kind of thing going on with your environment so it's kind of this impartial judge of the buildability of your software project so that's that's pretty huge too okay so the way I want you guys to go about this is to define a new file which you will have to SVN add um, and commit to your Google project called Jenkins.build.xml. And inside this uh, build file, you're gonna do define whatever it is you want to have happen under continuous integration. The easiest way to get started is to say that what happens under continuous integration is exactly the same as what happens when I run verify. And here's the lines of code that do it very simply. You're gonna define this Jenkins.build.xml You'll have the project name Jenkins. The default target will be Jenkins. You define the target called Jenkins. It depends upon the verify target. Okay, you're all done. And it imports the verify.build.xml so you get all those definitions. Okay, I like you to start this way because it is the simplest way to kind of get a grip on what's going on. What you'll discover as you get more advanced with your continuous integration usage is that you may want to have your continuous integration um, build process be a little different from your verify okay it may run extra things um, and and so forth or you may have um, basically daily uh, targets that um, that that run under different kind of jobs anyway there's more complexity that you can introduce to the continuous integration process it's I, I like isolating all that build code inside a special purpose file jenkins.build.xml um, but to get started quickly, we can just make it very simple. So that's the reason why I don't have you just run verify. I like you to set it up so that you can evolve and make your continuous integration stuff more complicated, more sophisticated over time. And you've got the framework set up um, already for that. Okay, so setting up continuous integration, um, you got to log into a Jenkins server. I'll give you the password and class for how to do that. You define a continuous integration job for your project. And the easiest way to do it is to simply copy the Watt Depot simple app job, which I've got set up. And it'll do almost everything that you need it to do. I'll go through that in a second. And then you want to kind of build the system. You want to do a test commit to see that uh, you know everything uh, works fine when, when you commit when you make a change run verify and then also it's important and make sure that the build is triggered within a minute and then it's also important to check to see what happens when you make a change that actually breaks the system that the appropriate things happen okay so let's try that out shall we uh, okay so the first thing I want to do is just show you that I've added a new file called jenkins.build.xml to my um, Watt Depot simple app application. And as I was talking about before, it's simply going to import the verify.build.xml and it's going to uh, run the verify target. Okay? And, um, you know, in my subversion, you can see that this Jenkins.build.xml has been committed. Um, 
and we can also actually even see it if we go to let's see let's get to it this way here's what depot Here's Watt Depot Simple App. And then if I go to Source, and I go to Trunk, there she blow, there she is, jenkins.build.xml. Okay, so this is the first thing that's very important to do, is to, you gotta define this file, and it could actually be just a copy of this. You could just download this file and, and uh, copy it directly into your directory, because it'll, it, it'll work just fine as is. But you gotta have that in your project. Second thing you gotta do, is go to dasha.ics.hawaii.eu colon 9859 and that will bring you to the Jenkins continuous integration server for our class. You'll see that I am logged in right now as ICS413 which is the username that I'm using and I will give you in class a username and password so that you can log in too. If anybody can go to this site on the internet and see the status of these projects, which is reasonable. But without being able to log in, you cannot make any changes or define new jobs. Okay? So let's take a little tour through here. The I'm uh the the uh this has one job defined for it. So let's take a look at that job. This is the Watt Depot Simple App job that I defined a couple days ago. And you can see it has a listing of all the different builds that have occurred. Um, it's got some things you can do. Um, you can uh, configure the project, you can delete it, you can build it if you want. And so let's, let's just try to manually invoke a build. Now normally what happens is we don't manually invoke builds. We have the builds invoked for us automatically whenever there are changes made to our underlying configuration management repository. So maybe, maybe just for fun, let's do it that way. Um, so let's make a change to Jenkins.build.xml. We'll say currently do the same as verify. So I've made this change and now I'll commit change and I'll put a little message improved Jenkins build file documentation and I'll commit we see the little commit thing going okay so now it's committed so let's go back to this and I'm going to enable auto refresh which means that every 10 seconds it's going to update um, our system and we can kind of maybe even just go back to the top level okay so we get so every minute it's gonna check the repository so I don't know the next time it's gonna it's gonna actually look or not so we may have a few seconds here up oh, yeah that just refreshed the page so you can see down here every 10 seconds it's gonna say that it's looking for things so far not so good it's not uh, making any changes. And uh, while we're waiting, what I can say to you is that you could actually subscribe to this if you wanted to. You can also, it's also quite interesting, you can have multiple concurrent builds. That's what this build executor status is. Um, okay, so now we it's pulled the uh, Google code, you know, my Watt Depot simple app um, repositories discovered that I had committed a change and it did the whole thing. Okay, so let's see what happened. So it just did a build. So to, and we have a green ball, which means the build was successful. So we can click in to get a look at the details of this. So the first thing is we click to here, we can see that the uh, you know, the, the configuration, um, oh, I'll disable auto refresh because nothing else is happening now. Um, here's my configuration management message and I could, you know, click these links to find out more details. You know, we can find out, we can even see exactly what line of code I changed, that's pretty nice. 
but we'll go back to here and what we'll look at which is very useful is the console output and when you're actually doing a change it's kind of cool to um, to watch this in real time okay but it'll show you that you know this was started by a change to the uh, configuration management repository you can see the update command now we see that jenkins.build.xml was actually changed and then it um, is going to run this command which is it's going to run the jenkins.build.xml file which is going to invoke the jenkins target which is going to invoke the verify target and then we see all the stuff that it does as part of doing verify the build was successful uh, the jenkins target here and so everything's good okay um, and just for grins, if we go back to here and we do a build now, you can, you can manually invoke this. And then if we click here, we can go to console output. Here it says started by user ICS 413, so we know how this was actually invoked. And then you can watch the progress of the build in real time, which is pretty groovy, I think. Okay, and as you might expect, it's going to be successful again. Okay? Okay, now let's just for fun let's mess things up. So let's go to simple application and let's let's just delete a semicolon so that our project does not even compile and let's not run verify, okay, which would detect this error. Oh, I got to refresh. Okay, and did I forget to? I must not have saved this. Okay, here we go. Okay, so test commit with broken system don't do this at home okay so anyway we're going to commit a broken system and I'm just doing this so you can see what happens when when there's a failure so commit 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 okay it's committed and now we go to back to Jenkins and we go back to this project and now we see that it's doing a build test commit with broken system okay and so we see the builds failed okay because it didn't compile and that means if we go back to the top level you can see we've got a red ball now and also, we could see that I'm going to receive an email um, about the fact that the system failed. And just for fun, let's see if I got that email. Okay, so here's an example. Build failed in Jenkins. Okay, I get a pointer to the job. I get what I, you know, committed, and then I get a copy of the output. Okay, and we can click here to go back, and we see exactly what's happened. Okay, so that's pretty sweet, actually, if you, if you ask me. All right, but we don't like things being that way, so let's reintroduce our semicolon and let's refresh and commit our fixed version of the system because it's very stressful to have a broken system in configuration management. I don't like it at all. Okay, and so very shortly um, we will see that Jenkins is going to rebuild this system. Okay? So let's now um, go to the configure dialog so that you can see how it is that you set up one of these jobs. Okay, you have to define a project name and the project name should be unique within this Jenkins server. Oh, you can see now it's about to start doing things. You can have a description for it if you want. 
And then you can specify the Google Code website, which is, you know, the Google Code website. We specify, they, they, I installed a plugin so that it does knows about Google Code, so I click on that. And then you can specify how you want this thing to be built. And normally, the normal case is that you want to pull the software configuration management repository. And then there's this schedule, and this is designed to um, pull it every one minute. And it's and it actually would be you could actually get rid of that slash one if you wanted. But the nice but the reason why I specify it this way is that if you wanted it to be every five minutes, you just pl place that by a five. If you want it to be every 15 minutes, you replace it by a 15. So it just simplifies um, your, you don't have to remember how that, the, uh, the crazy star thing works. If you have to, you know, kind of refresh your memory, you can click on that help thing and it'll show you. Okay, you want to invoke ant, and what I did is um, I defined, I added a build step which said, to invoke this particular build file whose default target is Jenkins. Okay, so that's the way that we get it to invoke the Jenkins.build.xml file, not just the regular ant build file. And then the final thing, there's a lot of different things you can do. The simplest thing to do is to just email the developer when there's a failure um, so that they can know about it and do something about it. And in general, when you work in Teams, you'll list all of the team members here so that people can uh, can be informed. Okay, so we can see that it's been rebuilt. Now it passes. Everybody's happy again. The last thing I want to cover is how is it that you would add your own project to this Jenkins server? And it turns out it's super simple. Okay, what you do is you go back up to this top screen here and you click the new job button and let's say we're going to implement, you know, Watt, Depot, Katas, Johnson. Okay, something like that. So as a, uh, what do I want to say, as a convention in this class, or as mandated in this class, the name of your job should be the name of your project. Okay, just like, the, and the name of your project is the same in Eclipse, the name of your project is the same in Ant, name of your project is the same in Jenkins. Just use that one name everywhere. Use it as the name of the directory on your file system. If you just keep doing that, you will find that as life gets more complicated, there's just lots of less things you worry about because you've got a consistent naming convention for all the different places that you're talking about this project. Okay. I know every semester some of you think, no, I don't want to type that whole darn thing out. I'm going to shorten it. It's going to be way better. But I can tell you that it's not better. It's worse. Okay? It's always better to fully specify the name of your project and use the same project name in Ant, same project name in Eclipse, same project name in Jenkins, same project name in Google Project Hosting. Okay? All right, anyway, after, sorry for the little sermon, but I just see it all the time when I'm helping you guys. It's like, dude, you know, it's not good, okay? So specify the job name as being the same of your project, and then you're gonna say copy existing job, and you'll copy from Watt Depot Simple App, okay? Which we just saw works pretty good. And then click OK. Now we've got a new project, Watt Depot Cottage Johnson, cool, and what you have to do, basically almost the only thing you have to do, well, there's two things you have to do. One is you have to change this to be the name of, you know, your actual Google code project, okay? And the other thing you need to do is change the recipients to, you know, whoever it is, joe.smith at gmail.com, okay? And everything else should basically be okay, as long as you've, you know, defined your Jenkins.build.xml file the same way that we did. Okay? And if we do save, now we've got a new project called Watt Depot Cottage Johnson. It's not going to work because there is actually no Google Code project like that. But um, if we go back up to Jenkins, see now we're trying to build, and it probably won't work too well. 
if we click on this, we'll see that, and then we click in the build history, and then we click console output. Okay, it's like almost immediately we get an error because we couldn't check this thing out. Okay, but had we actually had a project, hopefully it would have all gone fine, or if it didn't go fine, then you'll have learned something useful about your project or about configuration management. Okay, so we're gonna go to here, and what we'll do is we'll click this, and I'm gonna delete this project because you know, it didn't really ever exist. All right, there you go. Your introduction to configuration, excuse me, continuous integration. It's very extremely simple. I don't think you're going to have any problems at all with this. At least I hope not. And I think you'll find the benefits are enormous. So enjoy.